let's get into the presentation. So the first one is by Mark Jackson. He's with uh, NOAA in uh, Oxnard, and um, he's going to be talking about the science behind the El Nino phenomenon. Mark? He's a scientist in charge, by the way. <laughs> I'm meteorologist in charge, but it's I start. sometimes manager in charge. I, I do have a few scientific brain cells left. Um, so I'm going to go over um, El Nino. And uh, you just, it, El Nino is here, right? Everything happened in the last couple of days. We always get the question back in, in August and September, is this an El Nino storm? Is this an El Nino storm? And so hopefully I'll give you some science behind a little bit about what this this whole phenomenon is um, a little bit about what's happened the last couple of days and uh, kind of what we expect now for the remainder of the winter because the winter just did start. So, and so, you don't hear and so in the news. It's not a very glorious word. It doesn't, doesn't sound like a monster or anything, um, but it stands for El Nino Southern Oscillation. Um, scientists like acronyms. And NOAA stands for the National Organization for the Advancement of Acronyms. <laughs> so we'll just get that out of the way. So when you hear about El Nino, it's simply the warming and the ENSO is the warming and the cooling of the equatorial Pacific Ocean. You've seen these pictures before. You saw the picture on the first slide. That's that warming and the cooling. Warm phase is El Nino. The cold phase is La Nina. Uh, we all know, you've heard this before, El Nino got its name from in the 1800s, the Peruvian fishermen who, who really kind of uh, saw their, their fishing industry collapse in December because the water was so warm. And, and, and as this happened, they tied it to December, uh, Christ child, so El Nino. Tip, each one uh, typically lasts about nine to 12 months, whether it's a La Nina or an El Nino, they peak in December. We classify them as weak, moderate, and strong. So you may have already heard or read in the news or on the news about how this is one of the strongest on record. So three categorizations of weak, moderate, and strong. And, and typically, El Nino brings above normal rainfall for Southern California, but that's not always the case. Um, and typically, with the, with the strong El Nino, and you'll see this in a minute, we have the best chance for above normal rainfall, but we also have had weak and moderate El Ninos that really don't produce much at all. And in fact, the last time we had above normal rainfall in Southern California was the winter of 2010-11. And if you all remember December of 2010, right before Christmas, we had about a week of storms. That was actually a strong La Nina. And La Ninas typically bring dry conditions. So it's a very difficult thing, even though it's a, it can be a, a very important predictor seasonal predictor of what to expect. Sometimes it throws curveballs and it doesn't really do what we expect. And for a while here, in November, December, we thought it had thrown a curveball. That still remains to be seen. Now, there's only been six strong El Ninos on record since 1950. And the, the most notorious ones uh, that probably a lot of you remember, 82, 83, and 97, 98. So the way this is categorized is strong is um, is by the temperatures in the equatorial Pacific. So you have to be careful that you don't rate an El Nino based on the storm activity in any one season. It's, it's simply how warm the ocean is in the central Pacific and other atmospheric circulations that go with that. There's a whole response, the atmosphere response to the ocean, which kind of feeds itself and the atmosphere kind of continues to warm that ocean and it just continues to go in the cycle until it all breaks down. Um, they are beginning to cool a little bit, the ocean temperatures, which is what was expected. Uh, we expected the temperatures to peak around December or January, and they're starting to cool a bit. Now, that doesn't mean that, that now we're going to start, there's not going to be any more storms, because there's always a lag. And you've also probably heard this is one of the strongest. It may end up being the strongest on record, and I can't emphasize that enough, strongest in terms of these temperatures. This is what it looks like. Uh, this is a, a figure that shows the uh, sea surface temperature anomaly. This is a monthly uh, plot that shows this warm, very characteristic band of, of water that stretches out from the central Pacific. That black box that you see on there, that black box, 
is a region called the 3.4 Nino region. And that is the one region that we can then use to compare month to month to month to season to season to season. So when we say that this is the maybe the strongest El Nino on record, it's based on the temperatures in that black box and going all the way back to 1950. So if you plot what those temperatures look like in that box, and these are three month averages from left to right, the bottom you see that's March, April, May, April, May, and June, and, and right in the middle is that October, November, December. I put the two strongest ones on record, the 82, 83, 97, 98. And as of September, October, November, you can see that we kind of fit right in between 82, 83, 97, 98. When the new number comes out for uh, uh, October, November, December, uh, next week the Climate Prediction Center will give us a new number on what that temperature will be. It's very possible that it's going to be above 97, 98, which would make it the strongest, uh, the warmest, I think it's more accurate to say the warmest El Nino, but it's the strongest El Nino on record. Um, this is a plot that shows different models that forecast what that temperature is going to do. And there's every model, no matter, no matter how, uh, no matter how alike they may appear on the surface, deep down inside, there's deep, different equations that take different data. So you have dynamical models, you have statistical models, they all come up with with different answers. And so there's kind of a spaghetti plot. And same kind of thing where you have those three month temperatures and kind of where it's peaking right there is where we are now. And, but the models are all in agreement that we're gonna to start to cool. And in fact, there could be the possibility that we're, we could go into a La Nina next, uh, next winter. So if we look back at our past strong El Ninos, typically this is the pattern we see uh, the, the graph on the, the graphic on the upper left shows the strong jet stream as it comes across the, the Pacific Ocean, uh, typically wetter than normal across California into the desert southwest, into uh, the southern states, typically warmer and drier uh, across Canada, and then it's dry up in the northeast U.S., which I'm sure they would enjoy after the record snowfall they had uh, up, in, up in the northeast. But there's impacts across, across the whole globe. There's impacts... Uh, throughout Australia. You can have droughts in Australia, Indonesia, uh, very dry, and uh, almost every continent experiences some sort of it impact from effect of El Nino. And so it is quite amazing that that warm band as it stretches across can really have a, such a dramatic effect on, on weather around the world. So this is what it should look like from October to December. Should be dry across the northern U.S., uh, dry in the Pacific Northwest, and this is why we've been scratching our heads, because um, as you might know, the Pacific Northwest, Oregon, and Washington has been extremely uh, uh, rainy and snowy. Suquamish Pass has a ton of snow. Um, not Maybe not so unusual for, for Central California, Northern California, but really kind of Pacific Northwest. So that's been kind of a puzzler. Um, typically, we have in this time period of October to December, uh, above normal um, to maybe about average in Southern California. This is what we've had so far. And this is, this is uh, showing the percent of normal precipitation. And, and uh, what you see here is this red blob in Southern California. And that's very unusual. Uh, we've been exceptionally dry October, November, December. Meanwhile, the Pacific Northwest has been very wet. Uh, the purples that you see within Texas and Illinois, Missouri, that's not quite so unusual for El Nino. The dry conditions up in the U.S. Uh, in the Northeast U.S., not quite so unusual. So we've been left out of the party, so to speak. If you look back at the last, at the six strong El Ninos, this is uh, downtown Los Angeles. From October 1st to May 31st, you see every one of those has above normal rainfall. And uh, the, the winters are 82, 83, 97, 98, which both 90, 97, 98, 83, 83 had about 200% of normal rainfall for downtown LA. And we know the kind of impacts that were, you know, part of the Santa Monica Pier was damaged in, 80, in uh, January of 83. And we also had uh, pretty dramatic impacts in 97, 98. If you look across California, for those six events that we know of, uh, almost all of them were wet all over California, with the one exception of the two there in the middle. So it's not a guarantee. 
However, you look down in Southern California, and for each one of these strong events, uh, there has been above normal rainfall.